All right. Hi, everybody. This is Megan Stewart. I'm with the Girl Scouts. And today I'll be interviewing Desiree Flores. She is a real life eco activist and eco conservationist. So it is four o'clock now, 401, and we'll give people another minute or two to join us. Um, feel free to say hello in the comment section and let us know you're there. And uh, we'll just give people a couple minutes. Let us know too while we're waiting if you're doing anything to celebrate Earth Day coming up tomorrow. Hi everyone, if you're joining, uh, we're just gonna give people another minute or two to join. Go ahead and say hi in the comment section. All right, Desiree, so far it's looking like we've got a little to no audience, so we can just get started and, oh, we've got Mac Group from Las Vegas. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Mac. How'd you hear about us? All right. All right. Well, Mac, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And hello, everybody again. My name is Megan Stewards, and I work for the Girl Scouts of Virginia Skyline here in Virginia. And I am helping us work through the Senior Eco Explorer Badge. And so um, today we'll be doing step one and I'll go over all the steps here in a minute, but we'll be interviewing with Desiree Flores, who is also here in Virginia with me. and. She's an eco-activist and eco-conservationist, and she works currently for the nonprofit activist group, um, Mothers Out Front. And so in, in a minute or two, we'll get to the interview, but I just wanna go ahead and intro the badge and give you all a little bit more information. So in the Eco Explorer, we'll be investigating environmental issues and working that, um, and then working to make positive changes to the environment around those issues. And you'll be taking a look at different environmental issues and then choose one initially to explore further. So this, the five steps will be first, meeting an eco explorer, which we're doing today with Desiree. Uh, number two, we'll explore biodiversity. Number three, we'll be investigating a global ecosystem issue. And then number four, we'll be planning a trip. And in today's COVID-19 world, it'll be a virtual trip to explore and work on an environmental issue. And then finally, step five will be sharing what you've learned. And personally, um, I'm a big environmentalist and conservationist, and I wanted to do this badge this week in honor of Earth Day tomorrow. And as some of you have heard before, and I truly believe every day is Earth Day. And uh, so this is really important work. And we'll go ahead and get started with Desiree. Desiree, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for having me. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Um, also, just wanted to give a little, um, sorry, recap on how I prepared for this interview. So for one, you'll want to do a little bit of research on uh, sort of journalist interview questions. There's a lot of great resources there on Google, um, but and there's a lot, when I first interviewed or um, searched for interview questions, uh, Google defaults to job interviews. So you'll wanna type in journalist interview questions. And then a really important step is that you always wanna have a backup. So either have a, one of those um, kind of handheld video recorders, you can also download an app 
on your phone to record your interview because writing can be difficult to capture everything from the interview. And for this particular one, we're gonna have a video recording of it as well. So you always wanna back up to, go, to return to and um, capture those notes. Okay, and then at the end of the interview, we'll open up the um, conversation to you if you've got any questions for Desiree. So you can either enter them while we're meeting or you can wait until the end, but we'll definitely open it up towards the end. Okay, Desiree. Thank you so much for agreeing to, um, to do this interview for everybody. Please tell us a little bit about your work with Mothers Out Front. Okay, sure. Um, well, one, I'm glad this isn't a job interview question because that would be a little more uh, uneasy and um, maybe stressful <laughs> when you're interviewing for a job. But uh, two, uh, I wanna just start by saying how I identify um, as that's a norm that we often do within um, circles where I work with environmental justice and also with mothers out front. So pronouns, um, she, her is fine to use. Um, and as far as identity, I identify as both being um, white uh, and as well as indigenous. So I just wanted to give that a little bit of that background. Um, so I will talk a little bit about Mothers Out Front. I've worked there for about a year now. Um, and I am a climate justice organizer. So uh, as my official title, a climate justice community organizer, meaning that I organize on the community level. Um, I think it's important to just bring up the idea of activist versus organizer. Um, as Megan here describes me as an activist, yes, that I am. Um, I probably have been an activist uh, participating in or you know, activating and participating in um, demonstrations, protests, uh, anything you can think of as even writing a letter to the editor or doing something to bring about a change that you want to see in our society. Um, and I've been participating in those sort of things probably since college. However, um, as an organizer, um, organizers often take the back seat to some of that. What we do at Mothers Out Front is we mobilize mothers to take action on climate. And um, specifically, we mobilize mothers to um, advocate for a livable future for all children. Um, now, why, so I'll talk a little bit about <laughs> why do we do this as mothers? So why am I mobilizing specifically mothers um, to tackle this issue of climate? Uh, that's, you know, might think, why not just mobilize everyone? Well, in the climate movement, we're seeing a lot of groups that are very focused on advocating people within their group and how they self-identify as well. So sometimes some of them are based on culture or ethnic identity, um, others are on youth. So right now we're seeing some of the biggest movement comes from the youth. Um, and that's also what Mothers Out Front does is it was a group founded by mothers um, who were concerned about their children's future and about their children having a livable climate. Um, because, well, why, why is that? Well, we know that the youth are gonna experience some of the worst impacts of climate. Um, they have, most of the youth have never grown up in a, in a or never lived in a climate that was normal. Um, so we know the climate is not a distance, climate, the climate crisis that is, or a climate change um, is not something in our distant future. It's not something that we're gonna be anticipating, you know, 30 to 50 years from now. Um, it's happening now. Uh, we're already seeing the impacts um, we're seeing the impacts from increased storm activity, um, and natural disasters, crop loss, uh, drought, and many other things, um, increases in pests. Uh, and so all of these things have so many impacts throughout our lives. And I'll talk a little bit about that more you know, throughout the interview. But um, we know that people are experiencing these now and that we are, need to mobilize mothers now um, to support the youth movement. So that's a big piece of what I do. That's really great, incredible work that you're doing. And I, I appreciate you making the, the differentiation between an organizer and an activist. I hadn't heard of that myself and um, it, it definitely makes sense and it's an important distinction. So I appreciate that. And thank you for all the good work you're doing. Um, so that kind of I guess answer is my next question. I was gonna ask if you described yourself as an eco-activist and um, you know, as someone who's made or is making a difference in the environmental field. So it sounds like that's a yes. 
<laughs> yeah, and I can elaborate that a, a little bit more. Yes, yeah, so I would describe myself as an eco-activist because yeah, everything that I do or mobilize others to do, I also do myself. Um, so I just, to, I'll elaborate a little bit more on the, I only touched on the idea of the activist versus organizer, but um, as an example, I, you know, I mobilize mothers. So one thing that I do is I form community teams um, and are these teams of mothers, I help train them to take action and empower them so that they know that they have this power themselves, that it's not just me. They don't have to wait on me to write a letter, to create a petition, um, to organize a campaign plan, uh, to figure out what policy solutions we want. We've even had, and so we empower these teams to be, um, I guess, self-sufficient. You know, we don't want to be the ones holding their hands the whole time. We want them to feel that they have the power, and they do. Um, sometimes it's just the realization of that power. So as an organizer, instead, I think a good example would be, instead of me just attending a rally, I might be organizing that rally. Or instead of me um, writing a letter to the editor, I would lead a training for my team on how to write a letter to the editor, or how to talk to the press, or strategic plans of how to, you know, of how to um, create a campaign, or, you know, how to even, we've even had mothers who have worked on bills that have gone to the state legislator um, with one of their state representatives. So, and they, they just said, they had no idea they could even do that. I said, yes, but as um, you have that power, you know, you can work with, you can contact your legislator, and if they are interested enough, you can even advise them on policy. So these are all the types of things that we do, not just as activists in ourselves, but empowering others, and that's the big piece. So yes, I'm an activist, but I also think of myself as someone that organizes and empowers others to also take action. Because I think what's really important to say here is that one person can create some change. Yes, that's where it stems from. And then even a small group can create change. But what we really see changes is from a movement, and that is growing your power through a larger group of people. And I had a Great. Two, really a quote I want to go ahead. No, yeah. Share your um, That'd be great. Yeah, it's a quote from Margaret Mead, and uh, she says that um, there, I'm sorry, I lost, I lost my quote. I lost the exact quote. I don't, I want to make sure I do it justice. Um, uh, but it was saying that, um, so I'll, I'll come back to the quote. I want to make sure I have the exact words for it. And unfortunately, I lost the quote in my, uh, in my notes here. But it basically was the same idea that um, change is only created from a small group of people um, that, that then motivate others. Yeah, that's a, that's a great quote. And also, um, just your, your comments and your explanation of the difference um, of an activist versus an organizer just kind of speaks to this badge program. And, um, those like as girls are completing this badge, you are working as an individual, but you know, part of this interview, right? I'm talking to Desiree, um, and anyone that you might interview is likely an organizer of some sort. So know that you don't have to be on a huge, um, you know, um, level with a lot of people, just your, you and yourself, like, can be an eco activist, like your individual action. So um, I think it's, it's inspiring and great. And that's why this badge encourages this first step with uh, the interview. So you can get some ideas and talk to someone who has a lot of experience and then um, go forth and, but also feel uh, you know, empowered to know that whatever it is you do as an individual is important and does matter. All right. Did you find your quote or? Yeah, I shared my quote with you because I felt bad. <laughs> I just said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's only it's the only thing that ever has. I just didn't want to mess it up. I knew the quote, but you know. <laughs> no, it's a it's a powerful quote and a beautiful one, and I totally totally get that. And thank you for sharing. And I'll pay, um, post that in the live feed here as well, so you all get the exact words. All right. All right. So the next question. Desiree is, what inspired you to get involved with environmental issues? Uh-oh, might have lost her. The wind is really bad out there. All right. 
moment. All right, so I just posted in the group. We'll give her a minute or two to get her connection back. Hope y'all haven't lost me as well. Hi, Beth, thank you so much for joining. Um, let me know if, are you all still, it says we're still live. Uh, I'm so sorry, my internet just crashed. Um, I don't know if that happened no to anyone else. <laughs> yeah, the wind is, is really crazy. So I, I picked up on that we lost you, but we are, we're good to go. So the next question I had for you was, uh, what inspired you to get involved with environmental issues? So that's a good question. Um, like I said, I've been organizing since probably college um, around various environmental issues, but there's many things that led to um, this type of activism. Um, one, <laughs> I, um, I've been in, interested in environmental justice for a very long time. Um, I grew up in Baltimore where I witnessed a lot of environmental injustices, um, often in low-income communities. Um, and then additionally, I wanna really express that I feel personally that I have always had a very deep connection to with my natural world. Um, as I noted before, I do identify as indigenous and I'm an enrolled member of the Monacan Indian Nation. Um, and we are a tribe that is located in Virginia. And this, our, as an indigenous person, um, our worldview plays a lot of role in who I am and what my connection is with my natural world. Um, I will also say that um, uh, additionally, I have a degree in environmental science and natural resource management. Um, but from an indigenous perspective, you know, degree is one thing and then your connection also to your natural world is another. Um, and the reason I'm bringing up both these things is that I, I have that degree and I worked for about 11 years um, right after college in my field doing um, natural resource work in the fields of urban forestry, restoration and environmental education. Um, so I spent a lot of time outside, but also because of my own personal connections to my natural world through like my beliefs and um, my feelings of connectedness, you know, with our natural world, I spend a lot of time in, <laughs> outdoors and connecting with, you know, in, with nature. Um, I may personally refer to it more as, um, you know, a connection to our creator and to Mother Earth. And this is, this isn't tied to some of my own personal beliefs, not necessarily what I think everyone else should believe, but um, my connection to what I consider the gifts of our creator, um, led me to start to realize the changes that were happening in our world. So one, I would notice things. I worked on restoration projects where I would notice, you know, the loss of certain trees due to climate, um, that our climate was changing. Migration patterns of animals were changing. So I noticed those things. But then you also start to notice, um, I, I garden and I plant a lot of our traditional seeds, like the three sisters, which is corn, beans, and squash to indigenous people. Um, you notice the impacts that that has on your garden. Um, and then I also noticed because I lived in Baltimore, um, the impacts of like an urban heat island effect and the longer summers, the winters that were not as cold. So they weren't killing off pests or just all these, or we were having worse mosquito problems in the city. So many different things that you start to notice. Um, but then, um, so those things I, I, I felt powerless for a very long time. <laughs> and many people do, many people, the idea of, of climate is one very complex. You know, even to somebody that studied a science like myself, like you think, oh, it's just so complex. It's imp impacting us in so many different ways. Um, and then two, you think, well, how can I possibly stop it? I drive to work every day. I do, um, I use my computer, <laughs> you know, I do all of these things. I, you know, use electricity and it's all, I need these things. So what can I do? Well, you know, the, um, we can do things as individuals, but what it came down to, what I started to learn and understand is the top, the majority of fossil fuels, um, and is coming from about 25 companies, the burning of fossil fuels, the contribution yeah. to climate is really tied down to about 25 companies <laughs> or you know, these global um, international companies. Um, and who really are the, those that are accelerating climate. So as an individual, even if I changed what I, my behaviors, that would have a very small impact. What needs to, what needed to happen for me in this realization was not just, I mean, yes, a bit of a culture change for everyone, because obviously there are things that we can do as individuals to have less of a, uh, an environmental impact or an eco footprint. But 
we also needed to see change on a larger scale. Um, but again, that leads you back to the powerless. Like, how do I have an impact on big oil? <laughs> how do I have an impact on fracked gas? You know, this huge expansion. So, you know, bring this full circle. This comes back to, uh, I first hear about the no dapple movements. Um, and that's the Dakota Access Pipeline, in case um, people haven't heard of that. Uh, and that impacted indigenous communities uh, that are Lakota at Standing Rock. And it directly impacted their food and water. And as an indigenous person, I wanted to stand up for them. So I started getting involved in that movement. Then not long after that, we found out about pipelines impacting Virginia. And of course, that's where we live or Megan and I live now. So um, I started realizing that these pipelines were going to be coming through um, numerous indigenous uh, lands in Virginia, um, not only impacting natural resources, land, water, air, things, you know, that we need to breathe <laughs> and live um, healthy lives, but also uh, going through some of our sacred sites and burial grounds and historic sites, um, areas that were, that were extremely culturally important to us, but that we maybe didn't own anymore or had limited rights to. Um, so that also became an issue. So fast forward a little bit, I did move from Baltimore back to, uh, Southwest Virginia, outside of Roanoke. And not long after I moved, I, I'll say I live in the Catawba uh, district, if people know where that is. Um, the Mountain Valley Pipeline came bulldozing through our community. And I think seeing that pipeline being built was like a wake up call to me. It said like, I saw what they were doing to our water. I saw the sedimentation going into water, threatening endangered species. Um, I saw just the idea of the fact that this pipeline was being built so close to people's homes, um, which if you know anything about fracked gas and our region, um, our region is, has a, um, a karst topography, and it's the reason we have lots of caves and this really unique ecosystem. But when you have a lot of caves and areas that can collapse easily and sink, that is a huge danger for pipelines. So, um, if you have a pipeline going through your home and you do have cars like we have where I live on my property, um, if that collapses, you're talking deadly explosion, survival, not really possible. So these people, not only, you know, are they being polluted, um, but they're also, their lives are literally in danger because of how close they are to this pipeline. So the water, they're drinking water because most of them have well water is being polluted. Um, and then also because children who live close or anyone who lives close to gas, as a result, gas leaks, period. <laughs> There's really no stopping it. Um, and methane gas is exponentially more potent of a greenhouse gas. Um, so just all of this knowledge, sorry, I missed the point there. Also methane gas also is one of the leading cause of asthma. So people who are living in close proximity to these pipelines are also at threats for asthma, lung disease, and, um, in addition to um, cardiovascular health is also impacted. So there's a lot of um, exposure to pollution and what that does to people's breathing and, um, and additional impacts uh, of this that are related to pipelines. So there's just so many um, intersectional impacts that we have to worry about. And I started to realize all of these and this was just a wake up movement of like, this is wrong. What they are doing in the name of profits in our community is wrong. And I let's all lastly mention that the other realization was that we weren't even going to benefit from that gas being transported. That most of it, I think 89 to 90 some percent of it is in the plan is meant for export you know, overseas. Um, a very small portion was potentially going to go to um, areas within Franklin County um, for industry, for other industry. But residents overall would not be getting this power. So we suffer the consequences for someone else's profit, but then also um, we don't actually benefit from it. So that was really my wake up call. Well, it's really, it's really powerful. And you know, I appreciate you explaining kind of the, you know, the lifelong um, path to, to that wake up call. And it's, it's really incredible to think about the fact that, you know, it ended up in your backyard, literally like affecting and um, threatening your family's well-being. And, um, but yet that was only kind of a part of the, the issue. So, you know, and, and to anyone 
joining us, we're interviewing as part of the Eco Explorer badge, and I'm here with Desiree Flores, who is um, an eco activist, an eco organizer, eco conservationist, and she works with mothers out front. And she just detailed a number of environmental issues that um, kind of have inspired, or sorry, a number of uh, issues or yeah, inspirations as to why she got into um, the eco activist and conservation and organizing. So, you know, we're looking at um, environmental injustices to low income communities. And, and really, a lot of what she listed is um, good ideas for your own badge work. Um, so, environmental injustices to low income communities, um, uh, certainly uh, pipelines and how that affects communities. Um, and then you've also gotten, there's some more, there's some political aspects in there, right? Like where the profits are going. And then um, urban forestry, ecological restoration as well. So there's, there's a lot of um, ideas here that she's given us. And this is another reason that you want to do these interviews, right? Um, someone in this field likely has a lot of experience. All right. So uh, next question. Um, in what environmental areas or fields have you made a difference by being an activist or, con or organizer, conservationist? And then also, is there one that maybe, or, or a campaign or an issue that you worked on where you you felt like your efforts were were really successful and um, you know you're really proud of? Um, so there's a lot. I, I, <laughs> I'll try to avoid sounding like I'm bragging, but I do want to offer like there's so many possibilities and ways you can have even small impacts that, you know, within the butterfly effect in the grander scheme of things, you really impact people's lives, even at a local level. Um, so I'll start with just a little bit of a timeline. Um, after college, I said I worked in the natural resource field and restoration projects, and I am really proud of all the work that we did. I created uh, I don't even, I can't even count. I was trying to think of how many schoolyard habitats that we created um, as part of these projects. Um, I did both environmental education and then also trained teachers on how to use these classrooms as outdoor classrooms and um, what we call schoolyard habitats, which are often like a flower garden, a wildflower garden, trees and things that a student can experience um, and study ecology in their schoolyard. So we created a lot of those. Um, we also planted a ton of trees in a really highly urban areas, especially lower income communities and communities of color in Baltimore that do suffer disproportionately um, from poor air quality. And so I like to think that these trees and things that I planted are improving that, especially ur urban, heat, urban heat island impacts in those areas, as well as water quality, because we know that trees also filter stormwater. And Baltimore has a lot of water quality issues, which I won't go into all the details about that, but I could talk on a whole separate inter interview just about water quality, because I am a very passionate water protector and water is life um, activist as well. Um, so those are two big things. And I will also say that environmental education, I can't talk enough about how I feel like I have changed the lives of just of students. Um, I recently had a youth who I taught in middle school in West Baltimore. Um, he looked me up on Facebook and I, and he was an adult and I only remembered him as a middle schooler. Uh, but he just, he was, he messaged me to tell me what a great impact I had on his life and how he was going into an environmental field um, and going into a green career because of the program that I ran it as an after school program at his school. And that was, there's actually two occasions where that happened. Another was a young woman who also then went on to work for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and went on to do also natural resource work. And both of them are now kind of doing the same thing. They're educating others. So it's kind of this train the trainer model. But I had that impact on two youth in my community who may have not had, if you know anything about West Baltimore, it is it has a lot of issues with crime and poverty and things like that where you know youth struggle they don't it, there's inequalities in education as well so they may not have ever known that opportunity existed to them so those that's one thing that sticks out um and then related to my more activist focused career now i'm working with a team of mothers in the new river valley and also one in roanoke who have done amazing things um to oppose fracked gas expansion in their community specifically the mountain valley pipeline and they have made such amazing sacrifices to continue to hold 
um, to hold the industry accountable for to protect their land and their water and their air quality um, and to protect the rights of the property owners and um, for those that live in Roanoke, it's spe specifically impacting their water quality. It'll likely cost the taxpayers $3.6 billion per year extra in tax dollars just to mitigate the costs of the pipeline. So just they've done an amazing job making people aware of these challenges, creating a movement, and they are still running this campaign and making it very difficult for the pipeline to be built. So I really appreciate all of their their hard work. Um, and I can't take credit for all of it because again, I'm the organizer and um, they're doing so much of this themselves also. So I'm very proud of that. Um, and I, I feel like we've had a big impact even though the pipeline is still in construction. Yeah. Um, I do think that we will win that fight. That's really exciting. And uh, thank you so much for sharing all those examples. And I would say um, to anyone joining us as well, like um, uh, Desiree has offered to um, give out her contact information if you want to interview her. And so um, you can both do more, a more general question and answer session like I'm doing with her now, or, you, you know, as you're hearing about all of her incredible experience, you could choose one of these particular um, topics to, to delve into. And um, Desiree, there was one thing you had mentioned when we were talking before uh, setting up the interview around how there is no, even though these are specific areas, but there is no such thing as a single issue. Could you talk oh, a little bit more about that? Um, yeah, there's a great quote, quote by um, Audre Lorde. And I guess I'm, t I'm tough with quotes because quotes, I always mess them up. So I'll try, I'll just say she, she did write that um, there is no single issues um, that because we don't live single issue lives. And that's not the exact quote. So I apologize about that. But um, the point is that there, that all of this is very intersectional. So, um, you know, we, we talk about climate and how, what its impacts are, um, whether it's on youth or communities of color, low income communities. Um, it really, the reason that I became a climate activist was because it does touch so many areas of our lives. Um, maybe it's within indigenous communities where it's a threat to our ancestral lands or burial grounds or a sacred site. Um, that's just being developed over. Um, it can have that impact, you know, on a cultural level, or it's, you know, directly your public health, not having clean water or clean air. Um, even in, in some movements, there's actually a connection between like the mis missing and murdered indigenous women is a movement now in the US and I won't talk about it in great depth, but um, indigenous women disproportionately are targeted as through both uh, through violence. And um, this often happens as a result of like man camps in some of these communities. So this, that's a really heavy topic to talk about, but you can see where this, there's so many different ways this touches us. And so the fossil fuel industry bringing in transient workers through man camps has often had an impact on indigenous communities as well, um, especially women. Uh, so that's what I mean when I say that um, this is intersectional and that we don't live single issue lives, that there are many things that um, impact our lives. And climate's one of those things that kind of touches us on many different angles. Yeah. Thank you for um, kind of explaining that a little bit further. And I don't mean to bring that up as a way to uh, intimidate the, um, the seniors as they uh, attempt to tackle an issue, but it's, it is an important consideration. Like you do, you know, to consider the far reaching impacts and how everything in nature really is connected. Um, that said, uh, don't let it overwhelm you and, and certainly pick something that speaks to your heart and, and go from there. It's always a good starting point. All right, so Desiree, you explained a couple of, um, or a few examples uh, where you really made a difference and were successful in some of these campaigns and efforts. So um, any tips on, on how, um, our, our seniors can prepare to make a difference as well and be successful? Um, well, I did want to point out that uh, starting tomorrow is um, a global Earth Day Live global climate strike. I mean, obviously, we're all in social distancing right now. Um, and there, I didn't even speak about the intersectionality between COVID-19 and climate because that exists too. Um, but I did want to encourage any youth, all youth, um, not just seniors, um, but youth of all ages um, 
to participate in the strike with us or the global climate strike. And for those of you that haven't heard yet about the global climate strike, um, I think a lot of people have heard of Greta, Greta Thunberg, <laughs> but um, if you haven't, <laughs> yes, yeah, she's, she's a European girl. She, she started the, the idea of the climate strike um, by taking striking in her own country and actually taking a, a boat ride <laughs> across the ocean and um, and striking and just trying to get the public and make this uh, and make this statement and she was successful she got people's attention um, I want to highlight that she's not the only youth um, who's been taking action um, there are many in our own country especially youth of color <laughs> um, who have like and youth from frontline communities so when I say frontline I'm speaking of those communities that really get hit first and worst from the climate crisis um, and that could be a community that is suffering from sea level rise um, many indigenous communities or poorer communities on coastal areas are already having to migrate and leave their communities um, because of sea level rise or it could be a community in an urban area suffering from poor air quality from the burning of fossil fuels. Um, or it could be one of the indigenous communities like I was speaking of before that is you know, being exploited or their lands are being exploited for fossil fuel expansion. So we have a broad definition of frontline, um, but I wanted to bring that up because um, there are many youth who are within these frontline communities that are taking action. And um, this week starting from Tomorrow through Friday, there will be an Earth Day Live where you can go and learn more information. And this is a completely youth-led movement. So when I say wow. youth, I'm saying ages 15 to 30, you know, is and that's each youth group that is involved um, maybe has a different age range um, because they cater to different populations. But some of these youth are Fridays for the Future. That's what the, the group that Greta Thunberg started. And, you know, she, Greta Thunberg did this at age 15 also. Um, and then there are, uh, the sunrise movement, um, which we have locally, a local Virginia sunrise. So if anybody here is listening is part of Virginia, I'd be happy to connect you to the local Virginia chapter of sunrise movement. We have a, there are often even more local chapters of that, like a Roanoke sunrise, a Richmond sunrise. Um, and then I know additionally in our area, in more of the Southwest area, we have the, um, we also have another chapter of a youth group, um, the Appalachian uh, Youth Climate Coalition. Wow. So these youth are, because they initially wanted to have a huge impact and gather and ask people to strike, uh, to stay, stop business as usual. We, this is the biggest issue of our time, um, strike with us. But um, since they were not able to do that due to social distancing, they, you know, redone their tactics and are now of course had to move to a virtual strike. So they're just asking people to, to, to check in, you know, to go to the Facebook live event and to um, learn, to find out ways to get involved, you know, and, and participate. So um, I'm sharing the links to this with Megan. I don't know if you still want me to try to share my screen so I can show the website. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Sure. Okay. I'll quickly share that. Um, oh, okay. Unfortunately, I'm not able to because uh, it says it's disabled. My apologies, Megan, but I'm going to send you the link. So if you would like to share it, yeah. Um, uh, there's a link to say that goes go to Earth Day Live. There will be national broadcasts as well as local ones. And I, I'll share the link. I don't know if everyone can see this through the live event, but. Um, there's it's strikewithus.org. Um, and that's just one of the groups that's that's hosting the Earth Day Live. Like I said, the Sunrise is involved, Fridays for the Future. And there's a number of other youth groups too. Those are just the ones that I work with most. So I'm um, I'm highlighting those. Um, yeah. And Mothers Out Front is also a supporter and we'll be doing some of our own Earth Day Live <laughs> webinars um, to support the movement. Cause one of our roles we see is supporting the youth led movement and listening to the youth. Um, and I just want to note, it's, this is so important because for many, many years and in our culture, I think in U.S. culture, sometimes youth are silenced. And this is why there is a youth-led movement is because their voice is important. And it's going to be, we have to rely on the youth to make this change because they're the ones that are going to have to impact. They're the ones who are going to have to adapt um, to the climate and to make the changes that are necessary to have a livable future. Um, I can't stress that enough <laughs> because... Um, 
climate at this point, climate change and the climate crisis is irreversible. And I don't say that to scare people, but we're beyond the point where we're going to go back to a normal climate. So the youth have to be innovative and have to think about how we continue to have a working society with a climate the way that we do. And, and But what we can do, even though it's irreversible, is we can prevent the worst of the impacts. Yeah. We're kind of at a crucial decision-making point at this time. Um, you know, the United Nations reports have said that we have 10 years, and actually that was about a year ago. So we have like nine years um, or less to make this change, to dramatically decrease our fossil fuel emissions. We're not on the track yet to do that. Um, if we don't, we're going to see catastrophic um, events that, you know, that are going to change our way of life forever. And, you know, we're going to see basically could eventually not just lead to, you know, natural disasters, but these things also take lives, you know? So I think yeah. that's, it's a heavy thing to discuss, but it's important to talk about, yeah. you know, yeah. we see things like Hurricane Maria, what that did to Puerto Rico or the recent hurricanes also in the Caribbean and the Bahamas that happened this past year. Yeah. But imagine seeing, you know, that's just going to escalate. <laughs> so we're seeing them already, but you know, this is going to escalate. Um, crop failure, things like that, things that are going to impact all of our way of life and our abilities to survive and live. So we're at this really crucial turning point where we can have, if we make the right policies now and change, and it doesn't have to be an unjust transition. We're proposing a just transition. So I can't say that enough. Meaning, you know, fossil fuel workers transitioning them and read and with job training to push them into clean renewable energy fields. Mm -hmm. um, you know, things like the coal industry are already dying. So people are, are already losing those jobs. How do we protect those people, you know, so that they have a, a livable future as well? Yeah. No, that's everything you said is, is so powerful and important to hear. And um, to our Girl Scouts who are, will be starting their Eco Explorer badge, um, you know, Desiree just made a really, really important points here about the criticality of youth involvement and um, the power of youth. So be inspired and, you know, remember that Greta is, she was only 15 last year. She's now 16, I, I guess, probably close to turning 16, but um, that's right in your age range. And um, just don't ever um, think that you can't make a difference. And we hope that this um, interview and then the rest of um, this Eco Explorer badge program will inspire you. Tomorrow at four, I'll be doing the Eco Advocate um, interview as well. Step one is part of that. Um, but before we uh, move on, I'm gonna um, ask Desiree if she has any last thoughts or words of advice you'd like to share with you all. Um, and uh, please, if you have any questions you'd like to ask Desiree, please uh, comment them here. And then afterwards, I'll put Desiree's email in the, um, the chat as well. So you can contact, contact her if you'd like to do an interview with her. All right, Desiree, any last thoughts or words of advice? Um, attend the strike. And I'll end on a t reading a quick quote from one of my personal uh, Sheroes, you know, women heroes. <laughs> her name is Winona LaDuke and she's been an activist. Um, I mean, look her up if you don't know her. She's an indigenous and I believe also Jewish activist um, who has worked with food sovereignty, climates and a lot of environmental work. And I'll just read this one quote from her, but it's basically about the, uh, the idea of changing and keeping perspective. So she says, another thing is people lose perspective. It is a cultural trait in America to think in terms of very short time periods. My advice is learn history, take responsibility for history, recognize that sometimes things take a long time to change. If you look at your history in this country, you find that for most rights, people had to struggle. People in this era forgot that and quite often think they are entitled and are weary of struggling over any period of time. So I said that because I'm bringing this up because uh, don't give up the fight. Change takes a long time. Um, it can feel overwhelming. Sometimes we can feel powerless, but don't lose that perspective. Um, everything we've earned for, you know, freedom wise and rights wise was a struggle. The civil rights movement. Um, the indigenous, you know, the American Indian movement, um, things that have happened in this country, the women's vote <laughs> for that reason, you know, suffrage, 
movement was all a struggle. And it took people like myself, like Megan, like all of us contributing some piece of that. Um, I think it's around three, it takes, as far as the number of people it takes to create change is a lot smaller than we think. Um, we do need a movement, but it can be about 3.4%, I think it's 3.5% you know, of the population has to take action um, in order to create change. That's much smaller than I would have ever thought, but yeah. that's what our statistics show. So don't feel overwhelmed. One person maybe can't have a difference, but if you work together as a team, as groups, even small groups can create change. So I hope all of you decide to do that as well with whatever your issue is. <laughs> um, and please feel free to reach out to me. And lastly, your parents, tell them to, their generation needs to know. <laughs> um, so tell your parents to get involved as well. You know, bring your parents to the Climate Strike Week. Um, I hope you attend, but get your mom or get your dad to attend as well too. Um, and if they want to, they're often also welcome to join us with that Mothers Out Front, so. Thank you so much for having me, Megan. Absolutely, Desiree. This was really insightful and inspiring. And I'm going to definitely take some time to uh, reflect on our conversation um, so that, you know, I use this to um, help me move on to the next couple steps of this badge. And um, I've, I've put Desiree's contact information here. And if you all catch this on um, this video later and you want, um, access to any of this info, please reach out to us. We're here to support you. Um, stay healthy and we'll, um, we'll see you later. Thanks everyone. Bye Desiree.